Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. In this episode, Jörn Larsen, founder of Trifork, speaks with John LeDrew, organizational coach, and Marcus Fitfer, agile coach and mindfulness trainer. They discuss what triggers stress for developers, along with the best ways to deal with that stress. Created for developers by developers, GoTo gathers the best minds in the software community. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in Chicago, Amsterdam, and Copenhagen, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. We are sitting here in Amsterdam at GoTo Amsterdam, and uh, in the studio here we have uh, John and Marcus. And we are going to talk about uh, stress and developers, positive stress, negative stress, what can we do about it. And I'm Jörn Larsen, I'm from the GOAT organization, I'm very pleased to have you here. So maybe you can start introducing yourself. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm John LeDrew. Um, I was speaking today on psychological safety in teams. Um, I've been um, a kind of IT consultant and software engineering consultant and agile coach for about 20 years. Um, and uh, yeah, it kind of wraps me up. <laughs> yeah, hello. Um, my name is Marcus Witwer. I spoke today on mindfulness, mindfulness in organizations, and especially mindfulness for nerds and techies and how they can utilize that. And I'm actually also mostly an agile coach, um, like really right now developing this idea of bringing mindfulness in organizations. What drives developer stress? And uh, I'm here talking about more the negative stress. I mean, what makes people stress and you later it could uh, affect health. So what, what do you see there? Um, well, for me, I think that, and this isn't really just engineers, but it's kind of anyone working, but the major cause of stress is actually a lack of engagement in the work. It's the, and it, it's been shown in many studies that, that when you're engaged in what you do and you love what you do, you actually experience negative stress less. Um, it acts as almost a shield. Um, in my session, I talk about um, a, a story of an engineer imagining, you kind of imagine, so you're in the office at 7 p.m. and your boss charges in the office and said, oh, crap, we need to get this project done. You have to have a demo ready for me to show the CEO tomorrow. And oh, my God, you know, and this person is in the office till 2 a.m. and they're stressed and they're tired. And then the next story is, well, you're in the office and it's 7 p.m. And you're on, you've just started the project that you love. You know, you finished the old project, the one you didn't enjoy. And now... Uh, you look up at the clock and, oh, God, it's 2 a.m. Oh, I better get home. And now this time you get home and the ideas are still going crazy in your head. And you're like, oh, and then you just pick up your laptop and I know your wife grumbles and goes into the other room and swears at you or something. And then you're working until the sun's coming up the next day and you charge into the office early. You've got your laptop above your head and you're going, I did it. I finished the story. Oh, I did. I fixed the thing because you love what you're doing. You've not slept. But you're not stressed either. You're actually still completely yeah, you're exhausted. And I don't think working through the night is a good thing. In fact, I was only talking today to a, another a friend of mine who's been working with a team in London whose her challenge is actually that they're so engaged. It's such a positive environment that she has a problem with them setting boundaries, you know, and knowing when to, to tone it down because they're almost working too hard. But you find that that for me, the, the difference is, is most people are not engaged like that. And they experience this stress because of the fact they're so disengaged and they're in an environment that doesn't engage them and doesn't support their desire for doing good work and other things. And then a lack of mindfulness is a... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and what comes up for me right now is actually besides like uh, disengagement and besides, uh, yeah, disengagement, stuff like that, is um, a, 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 that people long for a sense of connection and long for a sense of that they can be themselves in a work environment, that they don't have to hide stuff they, they, they would usually bring and so that they can bring themselves fully into something. And, and that relates to psychological safety, because if it's not there, I have this idea that I need to hide parts of myself. So I'm really, what I'm really longing for as an agile coach, especially, is like for environments where people dare to show up as they are, or dare to show up more fully as they are. 
which doesn't really mean like you know telling all private stuff. That's it's okay. There are private things, but um, not having to kind of ugh, bend myself into kind of the right person to be at work. So, um, what skills are helpful in dealing with stress? So, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I think this is that the, one of the main aspects of of my session um, when I'm talking about psychological safety is this realization that many teams who are very clearly not psychologically safe in the way they behave, um, when I talk to them about that, they'll be like, no, no, we're fine. You know, we're absolutely fine. They'll say that, you know, we're absolutely fine while we're stood here with our arms crossed and, and not talking and clearly not communicating and we've just had a major project failure that was due to someone not speaking up about a big problem and all of these things that are obvious signs of a lack of psychological safety but they think they're absolutely fine and one of the reasons and this kind of leads well into um, what Marcus was talking about today on mindfulness is, is this lack of awareness of it's lack of self-awareness of how they are, and I, I call it paying attention. It's, it's really what I call a, a subset of mindfulness. So it's, mindfulness is a far more broader brush on, on kind of self-awareness and, and sense of self. This is very focused on how do I feel right now as an engineer or a, a person, part of a team, do I feel that I can be authentic? Can I be present as me right now, or are there bits of me that I'm not bringing? You know, I don't need to talk about them. It's almost that you said that you don't have to bring all of yourself, but it's not just, it's more like, do I feel like if I did open up about that thing I haven't yet, that that would be okay? Mm -hmm. Or is that not okay? Mm -hmm. You know, is it okay for me to talk about my challenges in life or the fact I'm tired this morning, or whatever it might be? Um, is it okay for me to say that I have, uh, you yeah, know, that I, I don't understand this technology that well, you know, that, that it seems everyone knows this technology really well, but I'm the only one that hasn't used it before. Um, is it okay for me to say I don't know how I fit into this project and I'm not quite sure who I should be working with or what I should be doing? Um, and becoming more mindful as an individual of how that works and how you are really, really helps and then allows the teams to... Um, allows teams as they kind of grow that shared mindfulness to, to, I find, to actually begin to have conversations about safety and recognise that as a group before they, yeah, before that they're, they're often stuck. It's like you can't solve a problem that you, you can't even talk about, you can't even describe or, or have an awareness of. So, yeah, so. Yeah, I agree. Um, so one thing is self-awareness, as you say. Um, an additional skill is then, if you have some kind of self-awareness, there's also a skill in expressing what's in yourself. Kind of, how do I actually say that I'm not feeling comfortable right now? Because many people then have like some kind of judgmental thinking. So the only idea they have how to express that is saying, well, you make me unsafe. Yeah. And actually being able to say that, well, right now I'm not feeling fully safe to share that, and could you help me or could we find a way how to do this? Um, that's, that's also an additional skill. Um, and I need both. And the interesting thing, what comes with self-awareness, so if I know better how I am myself, it, it's usually also developing empathy. Because if I know if I have a good sense of how I am and I have a good actually embodied sense of feeling how I am, then this automatically develops feeling, sensing how the other person is. And that, again, creates a lot of safety. So if there is even a few people having a high skill in self-awareness and empathy, it kind of invites the others to open up themselves too. So you actually mentioned mindfulness. And um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about, um, to, to, to get it closer, because I think a lot of our audience, they might not know, okay, they heard the term, but let's elaborate a little bit on, on what is it and, and uh, define it and get a little bit deeper. So I think the first thing to say that's important is that there's mindfulness practice. Um, so the practice of mindfulness is actually like being able to focus on something you choose. So it's a skill often of concentration. Um, and the interesting thing is that you can actually practice that. It's, it's really basically training, training your mind to be focused. 
And then depending on you know, what kind of school of mindfulness you follow and what kind of person you read, um, they define mindfulness as a combination of um, concentration, so being able to focus, but then also having or gaining clarity. And that's exactly the clarity we were just talking about. Clarity meaning um, gaining insight in what's going on in yourself. Um, and the third thing uh, is usually called equanimity. And equanimity means um, not being so attached to positive experiences because that creates pain when they go away and that's just, life is like that, they will go away. And also being not so um, kind of, yeah, in a negative way, touched by, by, by negative experiences. Um, because, yeah, that's also part of what happens. Yeah. Doesn't mean that I don't care about the world anymore. It just means that I'm actually experiencing them fully, but I'm not creating additional drama about it. I'm not really, you know, making things bigger as they are. I'm experiencing things as they are, but then I'm not making them bigger. And that's basically mindfulness. And the important thing is that you can train it. It's, it's really, there's enough research around that that says that with the right practices, you can train these three skills. So, I'm not sure what I can add. That's, it was a, a, a wonderfully succinct definition. I think that for me, when I think more about, I suppose, my own subset of that, which is the thing I focus on, which is this paying attention, as I call it, which is obviously a, a, a very specific thing, is, is when is that kind of almost encouraging people to become aware of their internal monologue. So for me, it's, it's literally saying, okay, so you're in a meeting and you're sat there and you're asking yourself, well, was I able to say what I needed to say? And you think, well, actually, I didn't say what I needed to say. I don't know why I didn't say what I... Oh, right, so was it because that happened? Was it because someone walked in that changed how comfortable I felt saying that? Um, so that's one thing is, is kind of is how I do that, which is very much I find that a lot of the a lot of people already have an internal monologue. Just becoming and bringing your attention to that can really help. One of the other things is is around um, to kind of extend what you were saying is also around <coughs> um, the the idea of of empathy uh, is for me is is a lot of conversations I have is is this kind of, you have conflict, you know, conflict in a team and conflict situations. Um, and it's kind of, people really struggle with empathy because it seems like a very soft and fluffy word, like this kind of like, you know, you've got the kind of typical room full of, I don't know, 20, 30 something male engineers who are just like, what the hell, empathy, this is so kind of, you know. And I find that it, when you actually, do, I normally just say, look, the main, the key thing is if you're going into that conversation, it could be a disagreement over an architectural thing or an argument with a junior engineer, whatever it might be, um, is always go into that conversation w with the idea that you might not be right, <laughs> which is a very hard thing to do because engineers, obviously, as engineers, we're always right, you know. Uh, in fact, I think the, uh, the trifle t shirt that was going around <laughs> today was, uh, was, I, was that I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not right all the time, but most of the time, or something like that, you know. And I think that's one of the, it's a joke I have, you know, as an engineer, I know it's, we're always right, it's brilliant. But is that basic assumption, because the problem is as soon as you assume you're right, in any conversation, you've created a hierarchy, which, which compromises the, the ability to have that conversation, actually compromises your own, mindful, your own mindfulness of that situation as well. I, I actually think performing an interview uh, makes you quite focused, and aware and uh, so I think that's maybe one of the things you can you can do if you want to learn something <laughs> new just make an interview with two very clever people <laughs> so maybe you can do this with your colleagues as well but um, the question now goes on, on on how can you get started with practicing mindfulness and I know there is a lot of resources out there but can we just have a little a few hints uh, so actually you can do it now so if you're listening you can stop the video and um, after I finished speaking. <laughs> um, and what you can do is like stop the video and take like a couple of really deep breaths. And when you do these deep breaths, notice the sensations of breathing in your body. Really notice where you actually feel your breath. You might notice it in your chest, in your stomach, in your nose. So do that for a you know, couple of breaths. And probably one thing you will notice is that once you start, your mind gets crazy. Your mind is going to 
somewhere else. So, oh, okay, yeah, there, there was this email I have to write. And, oh, you know, I need to fix dinner. And, you know, oh, I didn't really like the lunch I had today. So maybe next day, you know, you know, you know your mind is just doing all that stuff. And the practice is then to notice that and then return to the sensations of breathing in your body. And that's the whole practice. And doing that again and again kind of primes your mind to be more and more focused. Because you're deciding on being mindful with the breath. You're deciding that this is your focus. And you realize that you can't. And that's the training. So as often, as more and more as you do that, it's going to be easier after a while. And the other important thing is you don't need a quiet mind for that. It can be very kind of lots of stuff going on. The only thing you need to do is when you realize you're not with your breath anymore, you can come back. So no need to get a quiet mind. So one of my favorite meditation practices uh, is what's called a walking meditation. Um, so it's literally, you might be walking across the square, you might be walking around the parking lot in, you know, in your office or around the office, um, and you don't do it with your eyes closed, which is less intimidating. It's a really bad idea, in fact, to do it with your eyes closed. <laughs> it has a lot of health and safety risks. But the main thing you're doing is as you're walking around, as you're rotating your consciousness around the sensation, so the first time you're going to focus on the sensation of the ground touching your feet and the pressure and what happens if you walk a little faster, walk a little slower, then rotate it round and think, okay, well, what am I hearing right now? Am I hearing people speaking? Am I hearing the sound of the, the outdoors, the wind? What am I smelling? What am I seeing? And you really just bring all of that, rotate your consciousness around each one. And I find at times when I have been very stressed at work and have been experiencing a lot of stress, going outside, just walking often around the block, for 10 minutes or less a lot of the time. It's not even that long. It can be up to one end of the office to the other. And just focusing even just on my footsteps, you can just somehow it just it's a very, very grounding activity that really brings it back in. I find that a very easy one to do wherever I happen to be. So now we're going to talk a little bit about work environment and uh, how that affects your, your mood, your, your mind and the stress level and productivity. So... Um, so let's let's see um, what you can say about that. I think that uh, I think that for me, um, the most important thing in any situation is for the work environment to reflect accurately and closely reflect and align to the teams and the context of the work. In the same way, the process teams are following should be reflective of the work they're doing and the context in which they're working and who those people are. Their work should be. If your team as a team and as a group of people needs to work individually far more, needs to work on their own, needs to, you know, to be to be away. Well, your space should have spaces where those people can go and work in the way they are most effective. If your teams are always wanting to be kind of uh, stood around boards and drawing and collaborating together, again, your space should be flexible enough to allow all the people to be stood up and stood around boards and working in the way that best supports their needs. Um, if that happens to be team rooms and small spaces or a big open house, you know, warehouse with thousands of square meters of space, well, that's right in either of those contexts. I don't think there's a specific right way that is the best way. I think it's always about um, flexibility to allow the teams to experiment and explore what works for them. And that's likely to change over time. What works day one is likely to be different on day 100 because things change all the time. <laughs> Yeah, as a facilitator, I also love if there are flexible environments because then I can do stuff differently with teams. And I need this. Sometimes I need a big space for an open space conference. Sometimes I want to have people work in really small groups. Or me personally, like if I do my own work, I like to be alone. And I think there's also, besides that flexibility, I think there's also this element of that people actually do have different preferences. Like for me, I'm, I'm actually more introvert. So I need to have these times where I can be alone. I cannot be constantly in a open space um, environment in, in work. Um, and I would never select an employer who, who offers me just an open space environment. I would leave. And I think that's why companies have like so many different policies, why companies, some companies have open space and they kind of thrive. 
But then also because like the people self-select this company and there's another company and they just do remote work mm -hmm. and they don't have any office plan and yeah, and they they are good enough that they find the people who uh, who are kind of drawn to that kind of working. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to remember because there is no best plan. Yeah. Is there anything else like uh, cats, music, uh, whatever plans? Well, really uh, I think I don't think there's so there's a, a common uh, so a pet hate of mine are organisations um, that uh, that will often have some of the worst environments for working and often some of the worst and most toxic cultures I've seen. But it's all okay because they have a foosball table and a pool table and they you know they have beer in the fridge you know and it's it's kind of like you can't use. You can't actually, in fact, most, you know, it's the studies and the stuff that I um, have researched is, you know, the most, the, the most important thing to motivate and engaging your team is not providing them with, you know, a, a continuous supply of, of soda and beer. It's, it's those individuals feeling that they are making progress on the work they care about. <laughs> Amazingly enough, you know, your teams actually want to get work done. They want to do the things that drive the company forward and they want to understand those things. So when we have those like things that are being topped up in the environment, like, oh, it's cool because we've got beanbags in the corner and we've got, you know, we've got a foosball table and isn't that awesome? It's kind of, that's fine, but you will still have deeply disengaged teams if they're not making progress with their work and they're continually frustrated by the culture that's actually stopping them from achieving what they want to achieve. I actually have a very good friend and she opened a co-working space uh, together with some other friends and they were first thinking a lot about the room and what they need and and she always tells the story that they had like hours long discussions if they need like a really fancy coffee machine because they really didn't have a lot of money but they, they said on oh, co-working space and like you know everybody has this great coffee machine so people come in so at some point they start they said they, we don't have the money for that so let's just get started and then they realized that everybody who came actually drank tea <laughs> so so the, the people were really happy. They had like these 15 types of tea and, you know, just a kettle and everything. And, and that's it. And they never got a coffee machine. So it's really not about these, you know, things that you provide. That, you know, if the team wants it, yes, but, but really check. It's, it's not going to increase moral or, you know, motivation or whatever. Okay, one last question. Um, so... Um, we talked about being engaged is really important. Uh, do you have any tricks for how to be engaged? I guess you are both very engaged in what you do. And, and uh, what, what difference do you see between very engaged people and not engaged people? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? So I don't think there's anything that I can do to engage myself in that situation. I find that depending on the environment, and I enjoy these environments, I enjoy being in conferences surrounded, you know, having interesting conversations with intelligent people. So I find those in that an engaging environment. I find that there are other environments where I am significantly less engaged uh, in that circumstance. Um, I think that the important thing to look at is it's the environment and the system in which those uh, the team members are operating in which really dictates their level of engagement to that system and that work so if they are uh, in an organization that uh, doesn't encourage exploration and experimentation doesn't encourage or um, expect a certain degree of quality so that means that increases their satisfaction in their work um, doesn't don't have a leadership which is what I call facilitating progress so as a leader are you turning to your teams and saying what do you need from me to help you do the best you can do what do you need from me to deliver this to, you know next week or in a month's time whenever our next you know deadline is what do you need from me to help that happen when you have the team members that are actually facilitating progress you completely transform when you have a situation where teams feel essentially just all of the responsibility loaded on their back it's oh god we've got a deadline you know what i mean and in the the story i told at the beginning of the engineer actually the manager who runs in i kind of joking but he kind of storms like oh, i'm too stressed and he runs home and runs himself a bath with some nice bath salts because he's stressed but the team member's still back at the office working till 2 a.m trying to get the delivery out the door and when you have those kinds of disconnects 
it, it really does affect the team members, that kind of disconnect between leadership. So I think for me, it's, it, it's, it's in the leader's hands and in the people in those positions to think about how they're engaging their staff and what environment are you creating. And I mean that more metaphorically than the practical environment we were talking about um, that actually engages and creates a, an environment of engaged employees and not, yeah, not people that are uh, switched off and... Was it energy black holes is the term I use in my in my talk. <laughs> well, there are two things that come up. One is the, the kind of almost well-known model of uh, passion, autonomy, mastery. So, and that's what engages people. Yeah. And I would like to add something to it because like from my personal perspective, I'm self-employed now. I, I can imagine going back to being employed, but I I would make sure that my employer gives me space for my personal development. Mm -hmm. I would never work for someone where I have the sense, or in an organization where I have the sense that my personal development doesn't have enough space. That would really be a deal breaker for me. Um, so I think if a company can manage to kind of give each and every one space for what he or she you know, wants to become, that would be really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I actually, like the previous company I worked for, They actually have this now in, in their kind of, you know, in their, in their guideline or mission, whatever, vision, whatever they call it. Um, and they say, this is a company for the employees so that they can, you know, learn and, and, and grow. And, and, and that's the purpose of the company. That's how they define it. It's not serving a customer or something. It's really, it's a company where we have an environment where we can grow. Of, of course, they have like their business and You know, they do it in a specific way, but that's what I find really interesting. Just sure. add one little story onto that, which is that there's quite a well-known story, a company called Zappos in the US, they make shoes, uh, or they sell shoes. And there's a, a famous story from their team on engagement, which plays into kind of autonomy, really. And this idea is they, um, so they have the customer service team who are renowned as being a fantastic customer service team. So, you know, you might ring up and you've ordered some shoes and I don't know, the heels are broken and something's wrong and you complain. And what they did was, is they made a simple rule that said that the individual, the customer service agent, if the uh, value of the order is less than a thousand dollars, then that um, customer service agent has complete autonomy as to whether or not they give a refund to that customer. They can completely decide without getting any approvals or anything else. They can just say, yeah, I think that's a, you know, a, a rightful good reason for a refund and they'll process it. What's amazing is they did that and the total quantity of refunds, I think in the following quarter or year, I can't remember the time scale, uh, went down. Employee satisfaction skyrocketed. Um, and, and customer satisfaction went up. <laughs> so what's amazing is that, the, is that that's because their engagement, that little feeling of autonomy that those uh, individuals had in a role that often we tend to downplay. In our space, we love knowledge work. So we like saying we're knowledge workers because we work in this space. And that means everyone else, I guess, are stupid workers or knowledge-less <laughs> workers or something. It's, I think it's a slightly self-ingratiating category that we place ourselves into. And, uh, and we would often say that people doing things like customer service work or factory workers are not knowledge workers. They're following scripts and things like that. But you give those individuals a tiny amount of control over their own destiny, over their own uh, situation, and the engagement is, is huge. So that self-directed um, self -directed control is, is really foundational, I think, to, uh, to, to kind of engagement and, uh, and that sense of growth and connection with the work that you're doing <laughs> thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for staying late at the conference we are yeah we are getting late here and uh, <laughs> so um, um, thank you for listening out there and uh, I wish you a great day tomorrow as well. thanks so much yeah. thank, thank you. you so much thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo podcast head over to gotopia.tech for lots more content from the brightest minds in software development